Hey! I thought I saw you there, grade school family. How the heck are you? What's new with you guys? What's good? How's your week? My week's really good. I've been having a blast. I'm getting settled into my new space here that uh, I uh, showed off to some of you guys in an email this week, and I'm excited to show off more of as I uh, continue to get it all dialed in and get every last cable tamed and all the right furniture in the right place and all the fun stuff that comes with building up a grading suite, which is one of the things that we are going to be talking about in uh, the course that I'm going to be teaching in May, that I'm, or excuse me, in June, that we are going to be uh, announcing or, or opening registration for at the end of May, that I could not be more excited for. Uh, this is all of the knowledge and uh, information and sort of arrangement of those things that I wish that I'd had when I began color grading, that it's taken me years to kind of piece together and ultimately simplify down into a set of essential and sound practices when it comes to business, when it comes to actual grading technique, working with clients, setting up a room, getting your stuff calibrated, all of the above, everything that it takes to actually be a thriving professional colorist. Uh, that's what we're going to be covering in this course. So it's uh, designed not only for new colorists who are wanting to build the proper foundation, but for those of us who, like me, recognize like, you know what? I could stand to take the car apart and I know I could put it back together a little bit more cleanly if I uh, took the time to do that. So uh, that, that's, uh, it, it's going to be a really, really fun time. Uh, and that's uh, obviously fresh in my mind, and that's why I'm announcing it right off the bat. So uh, we, I've shared a little bit about this course uh, in the past couple weeks, but I'm going to keep giving you guys more info. Um, we're going to limit it to 100 people total. So uh, I want to keep a, a I want to keep a connection with you guys. And for those of us who do register, I want to feel like everyone has their chance to have their questions answered and get a little bit of individual attention. So uh, we're setting a cap at 100. Um, we've got the wait list link for uh, the course in the description for the show. So if you want to get on the wait list and be the first to know when we do uh, open up for uh, registration, then uh, you definitely want to click that link. Uh, we got like 200 colorists on that list already. Super excited that you guys are excited because I think it's going to be awesome. Uh, it's going to be really, really fun. Um, and what else? That's the, the that's the main stuff about the course. And then the, the first uh, group of people to sign up for the course when it does go live, we're going to get a free three month subscription to my premium uh, color grading creative uh, looks package, my colloid plugins that I don't talk about as much here on uh, YouTube, but they're the cream of the crop. They're the real deal. They're the things that I use in my practice uh, every single day as a working colorist. So that's another fun bonus among many others that we are going to have to offer uh, during the course. And uh, before I uh, move off of upcoming courses, I also want to talk about something I haven't mentioned, or maybe I have mentioned once or twice, but I'm also really excited about part two of my creative color science course that is going to be happening in May. Uh, the link for that will be in the description for this show as well. And that is a completely different course that I also really encourage you to check out, especially if you join me for Creative Color Science 1. It's going to be a continuation of Creative Color Science 1. And for those of you who are with me, the core goal of Creative Color Science 2 is maybe not what you would think. We're actually not trying to go deeper and go, I mean, we are going to go deeper, but we're not trying to get more complex in Creative Color Science 2. My goal is to show you a bunch of new stuff, a bunch of new things that I've discovered and built and learned over the years, but ultimately to kind of give you a tasting menu and let you sort of bring things back around to a more intuitive and more personal connection to your look development process, which is really what that Creative Color Science uh, series is all about. So I hope you'll check that out as well. Equally excited for that one. That one is going to be awesome. And I thought I would take just a minute before we get into grade school today to talk about the difference between those things. I mean, I think the difference is quite obvious. They're quite different subjects. And if you look at the summary for uh, that course and have heard me talk about uh, this course that uh, we're going to be doing here, there's really not much overlap. They're very different animals. So the difference should be obvious. But, you know, if we think about how do we prioritize or which one, uh, you, you, how, how should you be thinking about this for uh, yourself as a colorist who's looking to better themselves, Creative Color Science 2 is ideal for an intermediate Creative Color Science practitioner. You would definitely consider yourself that if you took Creative Color Science 1 and you've done a little bit of homework and kind of kept up with it since then. If not, you can grab Creative Color Science 1 and get ready for Creative Color Science 2. But that's really a very like narrow, although very important part of the practice of a professional colorist. You guys have heard me use this analogy before. If 
the uh, journeyman course that we're going to be doing here uh, in uh, June is about learning how to play the guitar and play the guitar really well. Creative Color Science 2 is about learning how to build your own guitar. And you guys have heard me make this comparison before that you don't need to be able to make guitars to be an excellent musician. However, if you play guitar for long enough, you will eventually arrive at a point where you're like, gosh, there's this that I don't love about this instrument and I wish I could get that behavior from that I love about this guitar or whatever and I, I wanna get this behavior that I love from that one. You end up wanting to build your own thing from scratch and that's really what Creative Color Science 2 is about. Highly recommend both of these courses, uh, but uh, just wanted to take a minute to give you that distinction. And also to mention that uh, if like all of us, you're on a budget, you can, uh, we're gonna have a payment plan uh, for uh, my course that we're gonna be doing in June. So you'll have the ability to pay in installments as opposed to paying in lump sums. Uh, so that's kind of what's going on course wise. I'm super excited to be uh, getting back into teaching these courses. It's been uh, a month or two since I taught my last course and I miss doing it. I, I love uh, talking with you guys here on Fridays in grade school, uh, but I love getting to go a little bit deeper with courses. So looking forward to those. Uh, a couple of other announcements before we get into things. Uh, I am very, very excited to be uh, a, a part of uh, Darren Mostyn's channel uh, this uh, week. There's a, a video that just got released uh, where uh, we got to do a little sit down interview when he was uh, here hanging out with me on his way to NAB last week. So go check that out. We had a blast. It was so much fun to meet in person. I hope all of you guys enjoyed Darren joining us uh, as a special surprise last week for grade school. We got a huge kick out of planning that and a huge kick out of uh, seeing you guys so excited about it. Uh, you know, because as I, I, I know that uh, everyone here on uh, my channel probably knows Darren and you're probably a big fan as you ought to be. I'm Darren's biggest fan and I, we, we talk all the time uh, about how much we respect and admire what one another are doing our, on YouTube, but we'd actually never met until we got together uh, last week. So it was super fun to connect in person, get together, shoot some content, and then uh, get to see all you guys uh, from the same physical location. Absolute blast. So go check out uh, the video that we did uh, together. And uh, as I know, you guys are probably already all doing, go check out Darren's channel. It's super awesome. Um, what else? Last week, we released a really cool update to my Kodak 2383 scene referred uh, LUT that uh, we've had out for a while this year. We have a version set up for DaVinci Wide Gamut, which as you know, is what I'm really advocating for here on the channel for my workflows. But there's also a version for ACES if you happen to be working that way. Really, really proud of what we did there in V2 uh, and excited uh, to have heard some initial thoughts and feedback from you guys that seems to be super positive. So if you haven't checked out V2 of the LUT, link for that is in the description as well. It's totally free. All you gotta do is give me your email address. If you don't wanna hear from me, if you get tired of uh, the stuff that I'm sending out, you don't find it valuable, you can always unsubscribe unsubscribe, but uh, the LUT itself is totally free, so you can go check that as well. And uh, my other freebies, my uh, mid-grade cheat sheet, my exposure chart, DCTL, uh, all the other normal stuff that you guys have uh, heard me talk about before, all my other color grading toolkit freebies that I normally offer are available uh, in the uh, description for the show as well. So I think that's it announcements wise. My buddy Rafa's here with me. We're here to answer some questions, but we're going to start by having a discussion by setting the record straight on LUTs. I really wanna to talk to you guys about LUTs because I, I feel like there is some persistent like misinformation, misunderstanding, half truths out there about LUTs that I wanna kinda of set the record straight on uh, for all of us because I think we could all stand to um, and, and because LUTs play a huge role uh, in post-production pipelines. They have for a long time, they're going to for a long time. So we might as well have our facts straight and. Uh, especially because you guys have heard me mention this before as well. We have a role as colorists today. We really good colorists. Every good colorist I've ever met is a natural educator, not in like a finger wagging, like you should know better kind of way, but in a generous sharing type of way where they're saying like, hey, you might not have been aware of this, but I'd love to share this with you. We need to be able to do that for our clients because if we don't understand LUTs, if we have some fuzziness on LUTs, imagine how much more our uh, production counterparts uh, have uh, in terms of misunderstanding of LUTs because they're not working with this stuff every day. So if we can level up our own knowledge, that makes us that much more valuable of a professional and of a collaborator to the people that we're working with. So let's do that. Let's talk about a couple of persistent myths that I see out there for LUTs or persistent sort of like like stock talking points that I think we can add a little bit more detail to, okay? 
So the first one, I'll sip my coffee while I contemplate this one. This is the first one that like can be expressed in different ways and you'll hear, hear people talk about it in different forms. But the essence of this first sort of LUT myth that I hear all the time, LUTs are destructive. Anybody ever heard that one before? You hear people say that, you hear people throw that around. It's one of those phrases that just sounds powerful. Like destructive in general is such an evocative word and we hear it thrown around and we go, oh, I don't want to destroy things. I want to create things. Destructive sounds bad. I better avoid that. LUTs are destructive. Here's the, so that's the myth. You want to know the reality? LUTs can be destructive, just like anything can be destructive. Uh, it depends on how you use it. To put it really briefly, LUTs are, what most of the time when we refer to LUTs being destructive, what we are really referring to is the fact that LUTs have a fixed lower and upper boundary. So if I think about shooting an image in Airy Log C, for example, that image is going to encode into a set of RGB values that have a range of zero to one, okay? If I have a LUT that has a fixed lower and upper boundary that only runs from 0.2 to 0.6, for example, that means that any of my camera negative that encoded into that 0 to 0.2 or 0.6 to 0.1 range, I'm going to lose all of that. That's going to get clipped off the moment that I apply the LUT. That's destructive, right? That's a great example of something being destructive. However, that's particular to that LUT. That's not an issue with all LUTs. That's an issue with that particular LUT. So LUTs are destructive. We're going to find a common theme with uh, sort of debunking this myth and the others that I'm going to talk about today. It can be true, but it comes down to the LUT that we are using. There's nothing innate about LUTs that are destructive because by contrast, if I have a LUT that has a lower boundary of zero and an upper boundary of one, and I feed an airy log C image through it, that LUT is not destructive, at least in the sense of clipping data on the top and bottom, which is usually what people are referring to when they accuse LUTs of being destructive. So that's number one, LUTs are destructive. Well, LUTs can be destructive, uh, but LUTs are not inherently destructive uh, to the image uh, in a problematic way, okay? Here's the next one. This is another one that's sort of like articulated in different ways um, and expressed in different forms, but the essence of the, uh, of the misconception here, LUTs are cheating. Anybody ever heard that one before? Or are you familiar with that sort of general sentiment that it's like, oh, well, if you use a LUT, you're not a real artist. You're handing off what you should be doing with your hands and your own personal knowledge, and you're entrusting it to a random LUT. I think we've all kind of been, we, we've, we've seen that sentiment expressed, and if you're like me, you've probably felt it once or twice before too. Like, oh man, even if I'm getting good results, am I like cheating? Am I doing the wrong way by using a LUT? LUTs are not cheating. Let me just get that out of the way right now. LUTs are not cheating any more than color management is cheating any more than like using the all of the processing that comes in between the light hitting your camera sensor and the data being recorded onto the disk of that camera. There's a bunch of processing going on in there that if you pushed that cinematographer, they wouldn't know what to do. They needed an engineer to figure that stuff out. doesn't mean that availing yourself of that technology is cheating. That just means you're availing yourself of technology, okay? So LUTs are the same way. LUTs are a way of availing yourself of technical and or creative transformation that you yourself are not capable of making. And that's okay. That goes right back to my analogy about building a guitar versus playing a guitar. You don't need to be, you're not any less of a musician if you don't know how to build a guitar. And you're certainly not any less of a musician if you're working on learning how to build a guitar. But in the meanwhile, you're just trying to play music, right? So LUTs are not cheating. LUTs are a tool that we should use in the same way that any tool in our arsenal is one that we should use. And most of the tools in our arsenal, we could not, if pressed, build ourselves from scratch on the spot. That's why the tool was made in the first place by a specialist who could. If we could build them all on the spot, on the fly, we probably wouldn't need or have the tool in the first place. So LUTs are cheating. That's one that we can just kind of debunk on its face. LUTs are not cheating. LUTs are an incredibly useful tool. Now, using them well, sourcing them well, and applying them uh, to get best results, that's not going to happen for you automatically. You have to know how to do that. But LUTs themselves are not cheating. LUTs are a tool. And if we use them well, then we'll get great results. 
And the last one that uh, I want to talk about before we, I, I, I hope you've built up some questions about LUTs. And before I feed this uh, or talk about this last one, just start thinking about the dumbest question you've ever had about LUTs, because uh, you guys have heard me mention this before. It's always the dumb questions that go unasked that are actually the ones that need to be asked and answered. Think of, try to think up the dumbest question you've ever had about LUTs. And if you're brave enough, put it in the chat and let me know what that question is, because I promise you, if you have it, someone else does too. And we're all going to benefit from setting the record straight once and for all on what feels like a dumb question, but what's probably a great question. Okay. While you think about that, let's talk about point number three. LUTs can't be trusted. Familiar with that one? That's that's kind of similar to, you know, LUTs are cheating. You can hear that expressed in different ways, but it's just this, if you're like me and you kind of are in post-production circles long enough, it's just this like taste in the air that you start to like get a, you start to sense over and over again. There's just this like mistrust of LUTs. So like, well, you know, best case scenario with a LUT, even if you're someone who's like, okay, I accept that LUTs aren't destructive or that they don't have to be. And I accept that LUTs aren't cheating uh, and, and that they can be a valuable tool. There's still this sort of idea that like, well, the best case scenario is you use it and it works and you kind of get away with it and it do, the, the LUT doesn't burn you, even though at any moment everything could go sideways and the LUT could let you down. The LUT could fail you, either with like, breakage in your image where all of a sudden you're getting some sort of nasty artifact or some other unknown, undescribed way that this LUT could let you down. To me, that's a, I don't know, maybe I'm alone in this. Maybe you guys haven't had that experience, but I've, I've really felt that over the years in the post-production business that like LUTs just can't really be trusted, even when they're on their best behavior, even when we have resigned ourselves to using them and even when we're getting good results for the moment. It's only a matter of time before they let us down, right? Let's can't be trusted. Also not true. People can't be trusted. You can't be trusted if you're not using LUTs well. I talk about this a lot in my show LUT design course. LUTs are what we can call picky eaters. So we need to feed a particular thing into a LUT and we need to expect a particular thing back out of a LUT. If we don't know what to feed it and we don't know what to expect back or we buck those assumptions, then it is true that sooner or later, that LUT is gonna do something we don't expect it to do that we're probably not gonna like. But that's not the LUT failing you. That's not, not the LUT sticking a knife in your back when you're not looking. That's you finally being burned for something that you should have known better than to do in the first place. So there's nothing untrustworthy. There's nothing duplicitous. There's nothing shady about LUTs. There's nothing shaky about LUTs. They're, can be those attributes about our understanding of a LUT and how we apply it. So I will say, this is a great segue to talk about the fact that if we're gonna use LUTs, at a bare minimum, we need to understand what type of LUT we are dealing with, and I can talk about uh, that further in uh, a minute here. And we need to understand two things beyond that. What does that LUT expect in terms of input color space? And what is that LUT set up to give back in terms of output color space? If you don't have those three things, input and output color space, and what type of LUT it is, then you really have no business using that LUT, and it's a good bet that sooner or later you're gonna get burned. But if you know those things, and you trust the LUT that you've sourced, then you're good to go. And that's really the final talking point that I, I would just mention to you guys. I've, I've heard this analogy uh, made by a, a, a good cinematographer friend that, you know, like, saying LUTs are good or LUTs are bad is kind of like saying that a, you know, if I, if I hand you a 100 sheet stack of pages and I say, hey, this is my screenplay. And you say, oh no, screenplays are bad. Would you, how, how would you know? You haven't read it. There's a good chance it's bad because screenwriting's hard and I'm not a screenwriter by trade, but you can't know whether my screenplay is good or bad until you read it, right? So same thing with LUTs. Like, LUTs are not inherently good or bad. LUTs can be phenomenally bad and do terrible things to your image. So even if you understand everything we're talking about and even if you understand, okay, what does this LUT expect and what is it gonna give me back? If it's a crappy LUT that wasn't well built, it can still let you down. But I would argue that's, again, not an issue with the LUT. That's an issue with your understanding of LUTs or in this case, where you chose to source your LUTs from. You know what I'm saying? So in the same way that like I wouldn't, dig my groceries out of a dumpster and say food poisons me, I wouldn't 
find a lot randomly on the internet or buy a lot from some random vendor who has no uh, who, who, whose credentials I can't verify and then say, oh, LUTs are bad. Well, no, LUTs aren't bad. That LUT is bad. Uh, and or perhaps you're misapplying it uh, or yeah, it, w w either of those things can be the case. But that's the last one that I just want to debunk once and for all. LUTs can't be trusted. That's not true. LUTs can be trusted as long as they are properly deployed and as long as they come from a trustworthy source in the same way that like, you know, that's like saying people can't be trusted to uh, abuse the analogy even further. Depends on the person, I suppose. Like people are not fundamentally untrustworthy. There's not some fundamental flaw in human beings that prevents any of them from ever being trustworthy. But at the same time, maybe you don't want to leave your wallet uh, on your front steps for a week and see what happens. Probably some untrustworthy person is going to take it at some point. Um, anyway, many uh, metaphors and analogies that I'm... Uh, going into to, to try to inject some common sense into a conversation that I feel like gets really uh, uh, off, out, out to lunch sometimes when it comes to LUTs. So that's a couple of myths that I wanted to kind of debunk for you guys. And we can talk about anything else you might want to talk to about uh, regarding LUTs today. And if we have time, we can do a little bit of freestyling as well. But curious, uh, during my rambling, if we had any questions come in about LUTs, Rafa, especially dumb ones. I love dumb questions. Yeah, we have a very basic question. Where in the node tree should you apply a LUT, beginning or end? Do I grade before the LUT or after? Yes, perfect questions. Where do we apply the LUT? Where do we do our grading in relation to the LUT? That's gonna go back to something that I mentioned ago that uh, I, I can give you guys as uh, sort of a, uh, a, a more tangible principle to walk away with today. There are four types of LUTs, four categories of LUTs that you really need to understand. And I'm gonna, uh, for today, just put it down to three types of LUTs, okay? Let's go into Resolve, and I'm gonna demonstrate these things in an interactive fashion. So let's talk about a couple different categories of LUTs. So the first category of LUT is gonna be a technical LUT. Technical LUT is exactly what it sounds like. A technical LUT is a LUT that's used to transform you from color space A to color space B, and that's it. You can think of a technical LUT as a alternative to a color space transform with no interactive parameters. So here in Resolve, if I uh, avoid all of my crazy folders and just look at the stock ones, VFX IO, this, this subfolder here in Resolve, this is a good example of a group of technical LUTs. These LUTs have zero creative opinion built into them they are just designed like, hey, if you've got a Cineon log image and you want to linearize it, that's what this LUT's going to do, okay? So that's a technical LUT. Next category of LUT, it's a LUT that, the, the type of LUT that I probably talk about the most here on the channel, it's the type of LUT that my elements LUTs are and that my PFE, the new 2383 LUT is. And it's a creative LUT. So in contrast to a technical LUT, which is strictly concerned with making a technical transformation from color space A to color space B, a creative LUT does not change my color space at all. All it does is impart creative character onto my image within my color space, okay? So the 2383 is a great example of this. Let's do the DaVinci Wide Gamut. Let's do the new V2, because it's new and shiny and we like it, right? And let's just make sure we're on an airy image. I can't remember if I've properly mapped that red footage. Let me just get this set up. So I'm going log C to DaVinci Intermediate, and I'm gonna turn this off, and I'm gonna pull up my power grade preset to go from uh, log C, and then let me set this up. So we're going DaVinci Wide, Gamut Intermediate to Rec 709, Gamma 24. This, by the way, is my node-based color management, if you guys are interested in that. Uh, but to go back to this, I'm now in DaVinci Wide Gamut here on Isabella, and if I load up my DaVinci Wide Gamut uh, 2383 LUT, you can see I'm actually, I don't need to change any of my color management around this because I'm Airy, or excuse me, I am DaVinci Wide Gamut Intermediate here, and I'm also DaVinci Wide Gamut Intermediate here, okay? All that I'm doing is applying a creative preferential manipulation in between, but I'm staying DaVinci Wide Gamut on either side and preserving my pipeline in the process. So that's our second category. We've got technical LUTs, which only technically transform. We've got creative LUTs, which only creatively transform and make no technical transformation. And then we've got a third category that you can probably guess at that I like to call hybrid LUTs. Hybrid LUTs do both, right? You want to know the textbook example of a hybrid LUT, easiest example to draw from? Here in the Resolve Film Looks library, any of these film looks. These are creative and technical in nature. 
they are imparting a quote unquote film look like so, like a, you know, this 709 2383 D65. That's imparting a filmic, uh, a film print characterization to the image, a creative preferential transform, but it's also transforming my image. It's transforming me from Cineon Log film negative domain into a Rec. 709 display space, right? So that's a hybrid LUT. Now, why did I just give you that whole pitch about hybrid LUTs and technical LUTs and creative LUTs? That's the number one thing, as I mentioned a moment ago, that you need to understand before you do anything with a LUT, you got to understand what kind of LUT you're working with. Because in my pipeline here, for example, if I turn my output transform back on, I'm now double transforming to 709. And as a result, I'm getting rather wonky looking results. So I'm gonna simplify the conversation for today and say that the best way to use a LUT for the most part in post-production, in color grading, in 2022, is to use a LUT as a creative LUT or to use a creative LUT, I should say. Hybrid LUTs can be useful, but then you're married to that color space unless you have an equivalent hybrid LUT that targets other display color spaces. Technical LUTs can be useful, but generally we have color space transforms for that, and those are gonna be better for reasons that I can also uh, go into uh, later on. So creative LUTs are really gonna be the most useful, most common type of LUTs that we're gonna wanna use when we're color grading, certainly is the case for me. So again, again good example would be the 2383 here. So to now go back to the question of several minutes ago of like, okay, where should I apply a LUT and when, uh, what should I do upstream or downstream of that LUT? If we assume creative LUT and if we assume sound color management pipeline, which as you guys know are non-negotiables for me, um, I'm gonna wanna do this LUT, this look, as the very last thing just before my output transform. Like so, where did that go? Here we go, like so. I'm gonna do this right here and what operations, sh what operations should I do downstream of this or downstream of here? Anybody know? I'm, I'm, I'm curious if anyone knows the answer to this one before uh, I give it. I'm going to open up the chat here because it's fun to interact with you guys. Call it out if you know. The question is, what of my grading operations should I do here? and or here? It's a bit of a trick question. And I know there's a, a little bit of lag getting my uh, ugly mug and voice uh, out to all you guys. So I'm going to give it just a second because I'm curious if I have any star pupils out there. Yak says exposure and contrast. That's a good guess. Josh says vignette. Yeah, so the question was, what grading operations should I do after my LUT or after my display transform? Okay, we got a couple good answers. Oh yeah, we got a couple good answers here. Darren has it, in all caps, none. That's exactly right, no grading operations. And I will give credit to Stand on a Mountain for saying YouTube conversion uh, there. That is indeed, if we wanted to use my uh, YouTube, uh, 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 what is the name of my own tool? I forget. Uh, my my uh, the, the, the uh, web viewing transform that I have for YouTube and Frame.io. If we wanted to use that, we're, that's exactly right. We would want to do that at the tail of the stack. However, that's not a grading operation. That's something to adapt my display transform. So. The answer is absolutely right. The answer that Darren gave is none. We want to do everything over here. Now, I happen to be at the timeline level, but I would generally want to do this back at the clip level, which, as you know, is going to flow into that timeline level from upstream. So I want to do all of my grading here upstream of that final output transform because that's my look. That's my glue. That's my macro level transform that uh, in the words of the Big Lebowski is gonna really tie the room together, but it's really only gonna do that optimally for me if it's the last thing to hit my image before that image finally gets output to the particular display that I'm targeting. So that's a very long question to what started as a simple, a uh, uh, very long answer I should say, to what started as a very simple and uh, quote unquote dumb question, but it's actually a great question. And uh, I hope all of that detail is uh, helpful in terms of uh, the, the answer there. What else we okay. got? 
Can you show your new lats on test charts and stress test and explain those? Yeah, we can talk about that a little bit. I'll, I'll give you guys, you know, like, how do I put this? Stress tests are a little problematic in my opinion, because they sort of violate the first rule of LUTs, which is that you have to feed them what they expect. LUTs aren't expecting that massive range of colors. So like the Da Vinci wide gamut LUT here, it's not expecting the primaries of like that, that popular stress test whose name, uh, the company's name escapes me at the moment, but it's not expecting the colors that are in that stress test. So we're kind of violating rule number one by, um, you know, like loading it in there. So I, I, I take it back. I'm not going to demo this on a stress test. And I'm going to give you guys a complete alternative to using stress tests. If you are building your own LUTs, you should not be deploying those LUTs until you know how to build them without needing to stress test them in that way at all, if that makes sense. And that takes some time. That's what we talk about in Creative Color Science 1 and in Creative Color Science 2 as well. And in show LUT design a bit as well. Like how do we actually design a thing that we don't need to uh, like fix its breakage points. We just need to make sure that we have proper bumpers up on our workflow in the first place so that they never get introduced. And similarly for stress testing other LUTs, I'll put it this way. I would never contemplate receiving a LUT from anyone that I, I didn't already know was going to be good. Like any of, if, if, if a color scientist friend says, Hey, here's this thing. I, I made it. I'd love you to check it out. It's log C to log C. It's a creative LUT that does some interesting things. I'm going to trust any of my friends, anyone who I am willing to receive that LUT from in the first place. I'm going to trust that they've done their homework in terms of like, like it's not complicated to make sure a LUT doesn't create clipping and, and uh, artifacting. It's quite simple. All you have to do is make sure that you're only, uh, that, that every possible valid color and uh, luminance value that you feed into that LUT yields a sensible output. Like it's not that complicated. Um, and the way you do it is by feeding a contextual input as opposed to a, hey, here's a big, big stress test that's completely outside the boundaries of what even a sound LUT is going to expect. Um, that would kind of be my approach there. So it's, it, I think, more about being sensible about who you, who and from where you source your LUTs. And if you're building them yourself, then you really need to know how to do that without relying on a stress test at all, because you can get, it can cut both ways. You can run a stress test and have encounter issues that are never actually going to be a material issue on a shot that's in the color space that that LUT expects. And you can also have a LUT that doesn't seem to produce any crazy issues on a stress test that actually does produce some problems when you feed that proper image through there. So the stress test thing I've, I've, moved away from more and more. What else we got? Okay, another basic question from Guy Layor. I once opened a lot in a text editor and discovered that it is just a list of numbers. Can you explain to the geeks among us how do LUTs actually work? Yeah, absolutely. So this will be fun. I'm going to show you guys something that I usually do in my show let design course, but we'll, we'll do a little sneak peek of it here. So I'm going to go to Lattice. I highly recommend Lattice if you are uh, a LUT enthusiast, if you're interested in LUTs, it's a really, really useful tool for manipulating LUTs. I'll be clear and say Lattice will not help you to create your own looks. It may help you to adapt or to uh, translate your looks or to prep them for a particular camera, but it's not a creative tool. It's a technical tool. It's a, it's a utility. Um, but let's just do a quick experiment. Easiest way to understand what those numbers mean in a LUT is to create a really, really simple LUT. So we're going to do a 1D LUT, which means it's just a list of numbers for what I should do to my red channel, what I should do to my green, what I should do to my blue. And there's going to be no interaction between those channels. They're each on parallel paths, if that makes sense. So we're going to do a 1D LUT. And instead of this default size of 4096, we're going to say three. That's going to be our whole LUT. All right. Now I'm going to hit create. And now I've created a unity three point LUT. And if I save this, let's call this, uh, let's see here. Let's call this a, let's call this three point ident like so. 
And now I can go onto my desktop and I can open up this three point ident in any text editor. I'm going to use sublime text. This is the contents of my three point LUT. And because it's so small, we can actually understand what's happening. So right here, red row, right here, green row, right here, blue row. And what it is saying is at inputs at these various input intervals, I want you to take those inputs and output them at the following values like so. And since this is a unity or an identity LUT, meaning it does absolutely nothing, input equals output in all three cases. So what we're actually saying, if I sort of read through the instructions of this LUT, what we're saying is in the red channel at a red value of zero, output a value of zero. In the red channel at an input of 0.5, of, uh, output a value of 0.5. So on and so forth through our green and through our blue. So that's the easiest way to understand what a LUT is. And uh, again, if you, I think the best way to like sort of scale this understanding is to invest in Lattice. And then once you feel like, okay, I've got a grasp on that, now build a five point, now build a hundred point and see if you can still sort of follow the bouncing ball or, or, or follow what you're reading. And then if you wanna get really fancy, you can start to make 3D LUTs and look at how those work. Principle is the same, it's just that the math gets a little bit more complicated because you have sets of three input values that yield three output values as opposed to one thing in, one thing out. So that's kind of a rough overview of the, the geeky side of things there. Okay. From Kodegi TV, what is the difference between a regular LAT and an LMT? And an LMT? Yeah. yeah. Not much, to be honest with you. Um, LMTs, I'm, I'm not going to swear by this because I'm going off the dome here. LMTs are basically a means of implementing LUTs with a couple of extra things. Uh, those extra things, namely being uh, a three by three matrix, and I think some basic math. I think you can actually, within an LMT, perhaps designate some simple math, such as like, hey, apply a power function of 2.4 to the pixels. I think, I actually wouldn't swear to that. Definitely, uh, you can include LUT data, and definitely you can include um, a three by three matrix, which you you could do in a, a LUT, but not directly. You'd have to like turn it into a set of sample points as opposed to saying, hey, take the image and you know take the, the input red, green, and blue and combine them in such a way to form this new red channel and then do the same exercise for green and blue, which as you guys may know from uh, prior uh, grade school chats, that's basically what a matrix is. Um, with an LMT, you can actually directly apply that math as opposed to applying uh, a, a identical transform using the sample points that you have with a LUT. Those are the main things that I can think of off the top of my dome that an LMT provides for. It's really just a LUT with a couple of extra bells and whistles, but uh, the meat of it, if you've got an LMT that is like driving a look, the meat of that is going to be uh, a set of uh, like data points to be sampled and interpolated the exact same way that a LUT is a set of data points to be sampled and interpolated. Okay, we have a question from a guy called Darren Mostyn. Don't know who that is. Who's this new guy? Man yeah, uh, I don't know him. Hey, Core Darren, management. glad you're here, buddy. Okay, core management in 52-bit is easier to handle than LUTs. Are LUTs just best for show LUTs and film emulation, in your opinion? He says that he prefers RCM slash slash for a space platform for color space work. So the question is, is it preferable to use technical lab or a color space transform? Oh yeah, I'm really glad uh, that Darren asked this uh, because it's it's a good thing to cover. Um, you know, I, I sort of like, I, I brought up my, my what I called the myth a couple of minutes ago that LUTs are destructive uh, and that that would seem to be sort of like the intuition behind the choice to use a technical LUT as opposed to a color space transform. Um, but I, I'll give first my short answer. Yes, I, I feel the same way. I prefer to use color space transforms. I prefer to use non LUT solutions where possible, simply because like, you know, we, we can uh, nuance our conversation a bit further about LUTs and how they fundamentally work right now by observing that LUTs are based on samples, as I just said. So 
For example, in the case of this three-point LUT that we were just looking at, what happens to, you know, you guys, we can all grasp that, okay, the image that I feed into this LUT is not, the, the pixels are not all going to fall into one of these three buckets, right? The pixels are not all going to be 0, 0.5, or 0.1. There's going to be values all the hell in between 0 and 0.5 and 0.5 and 0.1. In fact, that's the massive majority of the image. There are very, very, very few pixels in my image which will perfectly be 0.5 or 0 or 1, if any. So the way that LUTs work is when I feed a, it's kind of like a multiplication table. If I have a, you know, the, the multiplication tables that you guys... Do they still do, hopefully they still do multiplication tables in elementary school. Hopefully you guys know what, that, what I'm talking about and you had those when you were uh, in grade school, uh, pun intended, um, where you've actually got a table that says, hey, if you wanna know three times three, just follow the column over to three and follow the row down to three and look at the result here in the table and you know what three times three is. And if you wanna know what two times two is, go one to the left and one up and you can see what two times two is, right? Hopefully everyone knows what I'm talking about there. The question that we're kind of fundamentally asking here is like, well, what about 2.5 times 3? I don't have a data point for that. I don't have a column for 2.5. Same way, uh, same thing happens when we're dealing with images is like the LUT doesn't have a data point in this case, like for 0.25. It goes straight from 0 to 0.5. So what happens with pixel values that we feed into this image that fall in between? Those values get to use a fancy word that you'll be excited to finally understand when you leave grade school today. Those values get interpolated, estimated, guessed, because you can imagine, especially when we've got this very simple example here, all that an inter interpolation scheme does, and there's different ones, but all that it's going to do is say, well, if at zero, my output was zero, and at 0.5, my output is 0.5, what's a reasonable output for 0.25? In this case, that would be very simple, 0.25, right? But that's all that it's doing is making a guess and sort of connecting the lines in a smooth way between those actual sample points of the LUT. Now, why the hell am I going so deep into the weeds on interpolation and sampling? Because uh, of uh, Darren's observation and the question that uh, we're addressing, there is some fundamental imprecision. I won't say inaccuracy, but there's some imprecision in that system because all those points in between the sample points, and we can have three sample points, we can have 300 sample points in our LUT, but the reality is most of our uh, pixel data is going to fall in between our sample points, no matter how many we have, unless we have a sample point for every single possible entry in the table, which defeats the entire uh, premise of a LUT, and it would be uh, completely unwieldy for our machine to run. So in between those points, those points technically are estimations. So there's a bit, you can have a loss of precision there. So those are the, the sort of two things that can have a big impact or can have virtually no impact, but are good to understand about LUTs is you've got that upper and lower boundary that we talked about earlier, and then you've got the precision of the uh, LUT or the slight imprecision that comes from the fact that you are making interpolations or estimations between sample points in a LUT, if that makes sense. So for that reason, best practice would simply dictate, if I can make the exact same transformation using a tool which has no upper and lower boundaries and which has no rounding uh, in between sample points, if I have that tool on the table, or I have a tool on the table which uh, does have upper and lower boundaries and does have some rounding from uh, the imprecise sample from the imprecise uh, estimations that are being made in between sample points, that choice is clear. Now, would there be a tangible difference between in a given use case doing a, res a color space transform from Alexa to 709 and then cooking that into a LUT and doing that instead? Would there be a difference? Probably not. You, you could probably take the most like visually astute person in the world and show them that image and they wouldn't be able to tell you which was which, which is like if you ask them, which is less precise, which is less accurate, take the most trained person with the best eyesight. They won't be able to tell. However, you don't have to wonder about that experiment if you simply avail yourself of the more precise tool, if that makes sense. So if it's there, use it. 
But the reality is uh, for the, the, all the applications that Darren mentioned, of like if we're doing show LUTs, if we're grading uh, under a creative LUT that a color scientist has made for me, or I want to build a show LUT and give it to my camera department for production, we don't have the option of applying floating point sophisticated mathematical transformations on the fly inside of a camera. Or, uh, you know, like if, if I am uh, consulting for you as a color scientist and you want me to create a particular emulation, I can't create that emulation for you by giving you some instructions on where to move your lift and your gamma inside of Resolve. So what we're left with is the solution of a LUT, which is a very tidy, very efficient, and quite accurate when it's properly set up way of describing or encapsulating or uh, transmitting that transform in a way that is quite portable and doesn't require anything exotic uh, on whatever system or machine you are loading it. So very long answer that I suppose could have uh, made very simple by saying, yes, my preference would be to use floating point color space transform type operations when the option is available. But hopefully uh, you guys enjoyed the detour uh, a bit into why and uh, we all just learned a little bit more about the way LUTs actually work, hopefully. Regarding that, regarding how LUTs actually work, what is trilinear versus tetrahedral? It's complicated. I'll give you the short top level answer that tetrahedral is better. Uh, and in fact, if I remember to, I'll link you guys to a document that actually explains the geometrical, the 3D geometrical schemes that are used in both systems uh, to make those estimations. But all those are, are two different ways of arriving at that same fundamental question mark that any LUT is going to have that I was just talking about of like, okay, as long as I have pixels that are either 0 0.5 or 1, I'm good. My LUT knows exactly what to do, but I'm stumped if I have a 0.25, right? What do I do with that 0.25? What math do I employ to estimate what my output at that uh, value should be. The two most common schemes for making that estimation are trilinear and tetrahedral. Tetrahedral is better primarily because tetrahedral is going to preserve your neutrals. So if you have a neutral value such as 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, what is that? Well, it depends on the color space that we're in a little bit, but what is it not? It's not colorful. It's achromatic, right? It has no more red than green than blue, no more green than red than blue, no more blue than red than green, right? It's achromatic. It has no saturation. It has no color. Tetrahedral interpolation is going to ensure that achromatic neutrals like that stay achromatic and they don't end up getting pushed or biased in a particular direction. It's also more efficient. It's also more accurate. It's better all around. Go with tetrahedral. And uh, if you want to dive into the actual 3D geometry of the thing. Um, I'll try to remember to leave you guys a, a very handy link for learning it. It's fairly dense stuff and most of us can be quite content to say tetrahedral is better and I'm going to use it. Okay, a question from RAM Productions. How can we isolate certain aspects of a lot that we like for an image? Very good question. I've been asking this question for like a decade and arriving at answers periodically and, and discoveries periodically. Uh, I actually just finished doing a, or uh, am in the midst, I should say, of uh, a series on mixinglight.com, talking about that exact topic of like, how can we get inside of a LUT? It's not that easy because as we've uh, been observing for a lot of today's session, it's just a bunch of numbers. Like, how do we get in there? How do we decouple one behavior from another or extract just the contrast or just the color there's no easy objective way to do those things, but there are some really good principles we can use. Uh, and this series that I'm doing on mixing light uh, that I'm calling visual math is really all about like, okay, how can we meaningfully and uh, in a fairly objective way extract, for example, just the color transformation aspect of a LUT and leave behind the contrast. Uh, we talk about uh, a bunch of different variations on that theme in that series on mixing light. So encourage you to go check it out. You guys should be mixing light members anyway. If you're not, go sign up for the free seven day trial. Go binge all the episodes of that thing. And if you're convinced that that's the only useful stuff on the site and you don't need anything else, then you can cancel your subscription. But I was a mixing light subscriber long before I was a contributor and highly recommend it. Uh, and certainly for uh, this particular question, uh, that would be a great place to start uh, in terms of learning how to do those things. Is there a way to edit 3D LUTs in Resolve? 
For example, if I want to change the hue and saturation of certain colors at certain luminance levels, because as far as I know, curves only work at a 2D plane. Yes, I mean, it, I'll put it this way, like you can, you're, this is not really synonymous with editing a lot, but you can, LUTs also have a really handy dandy uh, principle to them in that because on the bright side of the fact that they're just a big long list of numbers that describes some stuff we did to an image somehow, like that's the, the, the sort of my, my scientific definition of a LUT is a bunch of numbers that describe some stuff that someone did to an image. The cool thing is that like you can, you can combine multiple things onto a LUT. So for example, if you want to, uh, let's go over here to resolve. Um, let's wipe out my 2383 here. Let's go to my 2383 here, go upstream and pull some contrast. Like, let's say I wasn't happy with this, but I'm now happy with that. And this is now my look. Here's before, there's after. There's no reason I can't make a LUT out of this. There's best practices with that. There's things we need to be careful of, but that's the core idea is that you can actually combine stuff you do upstream or downstream of a LUT into a brand new LUT if you want to. Uh, and that would certainly go for making hue manipulations as well. Now, is that the ideal way to uh, like change the behavior of a LUT? Probably not because you're, uh, you know, like you're, you're, you're fixing something that could be neutralized uh, in the first place if you had another what if you had a way of actually accessing the original like recipe, if you will, for uh, the LUT, but it certainly can work. Um, so that would be what you can do within Resolve in terms of saying like, oh, I wanna reimagine this LUT or change one or more of its characteristics. And actually, again, if you wanna go even further with that idea, I go furthest with it in that series I'm doing on Mixing Light right now about like, how do we really get in there and, and change things around in a non-destructive uh, and uh, objective way. Okay, this question comes from Jonas. Can I still use a Rec 709 LUT in DaVinci White Gamut if I apply it after a color space transform at the end of the clip level that converts from DaVinci White Gamut to Rec 709? What if I apply it between a color space transform sandwich from DaVinci to 709 and then to DaVinci again? Yeah, that's a, a good question. Uh, short answer, yes. Um, long answer, we should make a distinction between can and should. Um, there are a number of reasons why that's not going to be the most sound thing you could do. And it may, it likely won't lead to very pleasing images and it uh, likely will sooner or later lead to artifacts and uh, clipping and uh, issues like that, uh, that we were talking about at the beginning of the session today that kind of give lots of bad name. So yeah, you can do it. And in fact, I'll just to level with you guys, uh, just between us grade school gang, um, that is the fundamental genesis of these 2383 LUTs here. There is no such thing as an HDR film print, right? So whatever magic I worked, however I pulled it off, this 2383 profile, it started from an actual profile of the behavior of a 2383 print. And that 2383 print, by definition, was low dynamic range and in display space, right? There's no way around that. Film prints are not designed for scene space. They're designed for display space. So I'm, uh, you know, sort of like telling you not to do something, but I, in fact, did uh, not really with off-the-shelf techniques, but that is fundamentally how this 2383 LUT came about. It started with actual profiled 2383 data that I very, very carefully transformed and exploded back out into a wide gamut sort of scene space. So uh, it's not that it's impossible that it can't be done or that you can't get really great results like we're seeing here. I'm really happy with this LUT. However, even in this optimized application of that practice, it's still not ideal. The ideal would be to do something like my elements LUTs, which were never in display space to begin with. They started in scene space and they end in scene space and they just, live in that space flawlessly because they never were anything else, if that makes sense. And in fact, uh, those of you who've bought the Elements LUTs may have noticed that there is more than a, a passing similarity to some of the things that I find most pleasing about that 2383, because that's what I did when I was designing them is I love film prints. And I was like, well, I really love like the red density of that 2383. So let's kind of riff on that and borrow it 
for my thing. And the fun thing about that is that's a creative challenge and I'm able to do it all within scene space without having to worry about making, you know, doing the calisthenics of getting out to display space and back to scene space and somehow trying to net out with a reliable transform and a good looking image uh, along the way, which is not easy. But short answer, yes, you can. Uh, your mileage may vary in terms of what you're able to actually meaningfully do and get out of, uh, you know, doing things that way. How do you figure out what the input and output expectations are for a given LUT? Resolve as a bunch of print start LUTs, like a film LUTs. How do we know the in slash out expectations? Yeah, that's the, that's the, the million dollar question. And I'm going to give you the, the, my sort of like uh, grouchy old man answer first. The LUT designer needs to put it in the LUT. It drives me crazy when they don't do that. Let's just have a look at my LUTs here. You want to know what my snow LUT in the palette subfolder of the elements LUT does? Open it in Lattice or open it in a bloody text editor and it'll tell you. It's going to say, oh my goodness, does it not say? Is that not cooked in there? These are, I, 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 I'm going to guess that the production versions of these, here we go. Maybe that one was uh, a beta or something like that. But you can see, here's the title. Here's a description of what this thing is. And it's designed for DaVinci Wide Gamut, Intermediate, Input and Output. So that's the ideal, is that you are sourcing a LUT from uh, a source that actually tells you explicitly what the thing is. If that's not the case, and it's all too often not, um, the file name can be usually a pretty good clue. So like in the case of Aries, Alexa Log C to 709, this tells you, I want log C, I give back 709, right? The film looks LUTs give you one half of the puzzle. They tell you, well, you can expect Rec 709 out of the bargain. What they don't tell you is what exactly you're supposed to feed in there, which for the record is film negative, uh, and film negative has no rigorously, uh, objectively defined color space. So that's why these are difficult to get consistent great results out of unless you actually have scanned film negative, in which case, if you have scan neg and you're only delivering SDR, that's like the ideal use case for these film looks LUTs. Any other application I would be a little bit circumspect about, unless you've got a really good method for uh, transforming your uh, airy or whatever camera material into uh, the space, the color space of uh, an actual film negative. And if you've got that, let me know, because that's not that easy to come by. Uh, that was what I ended up, like, the, the if you, for any of you guys who've played around with the, the V2 of the 2383 LUT and enjoyed it, the change between V1 and V2 was in the negative profile. So you can you can see there's it, it's a fairly noticeable difference in a number of different ways. All that changed was the negative profile. I found a better, more robust, more accurate way to feed the 2383 data set that I had more of what it was expecting. And as a result, I got better results. I got closer to what the original designers of that print stock envisioned when they designed it because I was feeding it, a, I was feeding it more of what it was expecting, if that makes sense. Um, so another long answer, but that's, you know, check your metadata uh, for inputs and outputs, check file names for that, ask the designer if uh, that's not an option. And finally, I would say, you know, like this is another hard and fast rule that's kind of a bummer, but like if you can't figure, if you can't get hands on that information in any of those areas, that's a pretty good red flag that the LUT was not very meticulously designed. If that designer can't even be bothered to label their work, what are the chances that they got all the decisions perfectly right that go into designing a really robust and uh, uh, bulletproof LUT? Not high. Um, so some ideas there. Um, we got time for one more today. Do you use a LUT for your own YouTube intro slash outro discussions? I do not. Well, I take that back. I, I use a technical LUT. I use my web viewing transform for uploading to YouTube. But in terms of like creating the uh, actual grade of those images, I use uh, my DCTL tools, which are cousins to LUTs, but they're different uh, in the along the lines of what we were talking about a few minutes ago and that they are actually applying high precision math to every single pixel in the image as opposed to taking some known sample points and guessing at what value should fall in between. So is that a meaningful difference? I'm not so sure. It just so happens to be easier for me to implement 
my tools in that way than to cook everything into a LUT before I put it to work. With DCTLs, I can just code something up and then load it into Resolve and immediately run it in that way. So no, although I, I just have a, I have a fairly uh, niche substitute that I use in lieu of a LUT that if I didn't have, I would 100% uh, use a LUT for my Creative Transform for those YouTube intros and outros. Um, let's do one more actually, that, that, that was a quick one. What is the ideal exposure for the footage we should give to your 2383? If I feed it dark footage, it is hard to get it to look right without being crunchy. Yeah, uh, you know, like here, here's, this was actually one of my favorite parts about my conversation uh, that we had, uh, I forget, maybe a month or two back now with uh, Jill Bogdanovich talking about using LUTs and grading underneath LUTs. And we talked at length about, you know, like, let's actually look at this LUT for a second here. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. I hit the refresh button and now it's going to take a minute to spin itself up. Um, while it does that, what I'm going to show you guys in a moment here is that the curvature of any LUT, just the 1D curves of any film LUT, there's going to be a fairly linear portion in the middle. And then there's, there's going to be what we call a toe and a shoulder in the bottom and in the top. So if we look at the curve of like our 2383 here. So you can see it and this one is actually, let, let's go to, let's go to one of my palette lots. I think it'll be an easier example or tone, I should say. So let's look at summer. So this is very much going to have the character of a film print curve. So you've got kind of a linear section here in the middle and then you've got a shoulder and then you've got a toe where there's, there's more being done to the image in those regions. So you can just imagine if you've got an image that's hitting down here, that's going to do a lot. That's going to drive it even further into the floor as opposed to if you have an image that's hitting kind of somewhere in the sweet spot here, like where middle exposure is for uh, da Vinci wide gamma and intermediate, it's actually not going to move at all. Things are just going to move below and above it, right? So the ideal place to feed an image in is at the mid gray point for Da Vinci Wide Gamma and Intermediate, or for Da Vinci Intermediate, I should say, which off the top of my dome is, I think, 344 on a 10 bit scale. You can check it out in my mid gray cheat sheet. There's a free link available in the description for this show. Um, I'm trying to remember if that's right. It's, it's, I think, somewhere around there, 344 or so. So that's the ideal place to park it because then you're going to see no change in that exposure at all. If you have something that is a little bit under, it's going to get pushed even further under by uh, the 2383. Um, and I can go back to that now to prove that it's going to be equally true there. So if you're a little bit under, you're going to go more under by the time you get run through the LUT. Like look at the toe down here. If you're a little bit over, you're going to get pushed more over, right? So you kind of want to find that sweet spot which is anchored around the middle gray of the container. So I d theoretically, that's the ideal place to park your exposure so that it's not moving uh, and uh, everything is simply being compressed below and above it, if that makes sense. Um, and uh, just as a final word there, film prints have a lot of contrast. So it is not cheating, it is not wrong, it's not crazy. If you wanna use, there's a million ways that we can deal with uh, wanting the character of uh, this LUT, but a little bit less of that crunch. And the easiest would be to do something I showed you a moment ago, just go upstream and pull some contrast out. That's not cheating, that's not wrong. The, the LUT police, the color grading police are not going to come to your house and arrest you if you do that. This can be, instead of this being your look, this can be your look. And you can do everything upstream and just have a LUT that is preceded by a little bit of a contrast reduction, that's totally valid. So if something else you can, Think about uh, when you are uh, trying to figure out how to best uh, make use of this 2383. Um, boy, awesome session. Um, I hope you guys are excited about all that fun stuff that I shared uh, news about at the beginning. I hope you enjoyed getting to talk about LUTs in a bit more depth than we, I think we have in grade school before. We tend to talk about them very passingly and I go so deep on them in my show LUT design course that I often forget that for those of us who uh, aren't in that course, uh, that uh, we, there's some basics that we can all stand to understand, to, to grasp a little bit better. And we don't all have to be show LUT designers in order to uh, use LUTs better 
and to ensure that they're only helping our workflow and not harming our workflow. And as I mentioned earlier uh, in today's session, to be educators to our counterparts, to our production counterparts, to our collaborators, and help them get straight on LUTs tool, on LUTs too, because LUTs are a tool that are not going away. They're a really useful tool when applied properly. And if we understand them well, then we can use them in that way. And if we don't, then it's very unlikely that we're, that we're going to be able to do that. Um, so I hope you guys enjoyed the session. Always a pleasure hanging out with you guys. Um, I've got some new ideas for content that I'm going to be working on in the next couple of weeks. So I'm excited to share that stuff with you guys when it's time. Um, but in the meanwhile, I hope you all have an awesome weekend. Go check out the NAB, uh, uh, the uh, Virtually Vegas Colorist Mixer tomorrow. I'll leave a link to that in the description uh, as well here. Uh, that's going to be really fun. There's a bunch of really, really smart, really talented, really fun colorists who are going to be there. I'm going to be there uh, among them for uh, a couple different presentations during. Uh, go check it out. Go buy a ticket. You're supporting your community. You're supporting a, a really great organization, and it's going to be a blast. So I hope to see you guys there as well. I'll be there. Uh, maybe I'll do a little breakout room thing in there as well, and we can talk about something else new and exciting that we haven't gotten to cover before. I think Darren's going to be there, if I'm not mistaken. I'm really uh, glad Darren was able to join us today and really humbled that I got to join him on uh, his badass YouTube channel uh, this week. So thanks to my buddy Darren for that and for the, the laughs and the good time that we had last week. Thanks again to all of you guys. Always a pleasure seeing you. Thanks to my buddy Rafa for co-hosting and getting everybody's questions answered. And I will see you guys all very soon.